I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with festival of blood. So God establishes us in righteousness. We don't have to establish our own. So we don't have to worry about the accusations. We just have to face them and accept them and deal with it. He does it. If we try and argue our own case, then we are in the position of authority and therefore we have to face those things. So God makes there are a lot of different calls in heaven. Job one, there was a day on Sunday, he would present himself before the Lord and say from the adversary and future also came. So the enemy does have access to that love. He signed it to once. God stands in the assembly of the representatives of God in the midst of the magistrates and judges. He gives judgment as an unknown God. I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but actually there is a judicial judge, magistrate, assembly, and places in heaven that takes place. In the same verse in another version, he takes place in his divine council in the midst of the God and holds judgment. So there was, this is all judicial and going to. Psalm 89 7, greatly feared, God greatly feared and revered in the council of the holy and angelic ones, and to be feared and worshipped, revered by all those who have wrapped him. So, the council of the law. So, there is a council of the law. And Jesus did this to keep the around. In a court. So of course, Peter didn't have access to go to that court because this was before the veil was torn. So Jesus was standing, saying his desire to sit with Peter. Why well, did he know that? Because he'd been in heaven. And in the verse in Luke 22 31, the whole Satan has demanded permission to sit with you like we If I have prayed for you, you will save me not there. So we have an advocate on our behalf, Jesus. In the court, we don't go. But he's limited in what he can do. He couldn't stop Satan sitting Peter, but he could limit what Satan could do. Same with Job. God could not stop Job being attacked by Satan. Because Satan attacked him because Job was open the door because what he feared came upon him. So fear is always an open door to the enemy. But if Peter could have gone and stood before the accuser, Peter could have dealt with the accusation by agreeing with it and allowing God to give him freedom from it. So it's important that we go and face the accuser. Now sometimes, I'm pretty sensitive to this now, but I sense when there is an accusation against me because I sense a lack of peace or a weight. Um, and so I know I need to go to the court. But I can also go proactively call the court in session. So if I know I want to be set free from something I'm struggling with, mindset, behavior pattern, familiar spirit way of thinking, then I can call the call, call, but call those things to come and hear the accusations. I want to hear why they can do that to me. What's the legal right? So I can call them to come. I can get the verdict. Once I get the verdict, I have authority for them because of the legal rights for me. So Jesus was able to do this because he was living in the wells. Actually, we can do it because we have access to that realm as well. Satan is a legalist. So all those work for him, and they will try and trap you into legalist behavior, and they will exercise their authority because they have a legal right. Now, they get a legal right through things we do, through things we say, through things we think, things we act in, but also through generational things, sins, iniquities of our fathers and through generational things. There are lots of different courts. In our nation we have a family court, which mediates in family situations. We have a magistrate's court, which can only give a two-year sentence. Crown court, which is a court where people can be sentenced to life. High court, deal court, and so on, is our highest court of representation. The kingdom of God also has different courts. There are the accusation courts, the divorce courts, which deal with the restrictions, blockages, and accusations. But there's also other courts in heaven, which are the law courts, judicial mandates, financial mandates, many other different mandates. 
and there is caught right up in heaven heavens, like the council operates in there. So that's that's all. And I'll give you another picture which gives that in where in that realm. So accusation court, court mobile court accusation is in the realm of the kingdom of God and around us in the kingdom of this earth. We can convene in the spirit around us. Kingdom of God is the court war strategy of court angels, kingdom of heaven, court scribes and court chancellors, heaven, court of the kings, court of the upright, and the men like living on, and the court of the councils and the fathers, and then in heaven and heavens, the court of judges, the court of the Lord, and the court of seventy. Uh, there. So the enemy has no access beyond the kingdom of God. He cannot go because that's where the cherubim and the fiery sword guard the pathway into eternity. So to access that, as we looked at the previous session, we can go through the various realms of heaven and engage different levels of responsibility and court. <laughs> See that we have access when we're administrating to the angel court and the mobile court and the court of war. So the mobile court is the one we really want to focus on so we can begin to change things. So within the realm of the kingdom of heaven, you have access to the men of the white men and mostly the seven spirits of God who begin to train us in understanding the courts and understanding our position of government. And then in the realm of heaven, you have all the pathway of relationship, which is one thought, in terms of God and God, the river of life and tree of life. And the judgment seat of Christ, but you also have an angelic canopy over the throne of God, and you have access to those courts there. You can't just walk into them. You, know, you have to be given access with the authority. So, you know, I've been into them, um, but I was taken most of the time, so I knew how to use the protocol, and I could go there. It's part of the one. And the higher courts are pretty uh, intense. Stuff goes on up there. Um, so, the responsibility, the governmental charge of the courts, that's what God said that we can have if we walk in place. So, we're a chosen race of royal priesthood. 1 Corinthians 11 37 says, Judge yourselves. So, we have to be prepared. To bring judgment against ourselves to that court. In other words, we know where things are high. And rather than burying them or trying to avoid them, actually deal with them. And we have access to deal with them then. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 6 2 3 says this Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge the angels? How much more than others of this life? So if we're going to judge angels and judge those things, we have to bring judgment and a verdict into this life. So, you know, when we're talking about judgment, we're not talking about anything that goes to death. It's always judgment to life. So, we can be in the mobile court of accusation in the spiritual realm around us. Well, how do you do it? By faith. Call with the court we can be. And then engage. Close your eyes, engage in it. Or, if you're like me, you can keep your eyes open and you can guess your spirit will engage in it while you're here. Go and face the accuser in court. By faith in the Spirit, God is on his throne. He's the judge. He has a mobile throne. Read about it in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 11. The throne has wheels and comes into the court when you call it. Or also when the enemy calls accusations. So Jesus is our advocate. The accusers are the enemy. I mean, say they don't turn up in person too often. You know, it's usually the familiar spirits that are associated with our lives who are accusing us. We receive automatically modes of righteousness. That's really, really important when you do a judicial thing. You need to know your position of authority, know that you're cleansed. So, no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. Stand at the covering of the word of God for love and love of God. So, you're not standing in your own righteousness. We're standing under the covering of his love and his word and the blood of Jesus, which is why you can stand righteous. So now we hear the accusation. Now some, wherever they are, will come, they can't lie before this throne, because they're in the presence of God. They can't lie. So don't think, oh, I'm going to be deceived, I'm going to be led astray. In a sense, they will give you the accusations that they have against you if you continue to see. 
for that aspect. Well, for now, really. This may come as thoughts in your mind. You know, when we do court cases, often people have words come, a memory come, a experience come, that comes into their mind, and it's like, okay, that's the accusation. You know, it may come as a vision, you may have a, you know, depending on really how you see and how you engage. But very clear impressions come, you know. They come differently. When we do a, a corporate court case, um, with our leaders and our page 12, you know, we have 12 different, different perspectives on things, and we hear 12 different things, and we do 12 different presentations of that to deal with it. Because people come with their different ways, and some of them all line up, and you can see a theme. But often, it's like people here bring the same things in different ways. Don't argue. You know, if you're arguing, well, I didn't do that. I'm not guilty of that. Well, you're just trying to argue your own case. Except that what they're doing is the legal right. If you can't actually remember that you've done anything, then your generation will line will. So it will be visited on you whether you've done it or not. Because that's the principle of iniquity. It's generational. So agree with the accusations against you, repent of those things and renounce them. You don't want to continue doing that. If you're dealing with a familiar pattern, and you sometimes get to the point, well, how many times have I got to repent and renounce this? Because you've gone around this cycle loads and loads of times. Because familiar spirits take you down the cycle loads and loads of times. That's why they're familiar. And we fall for it. They push our buttons. They know what, what riles us or gets us wound up or the little triggers that bring this behavior or this social pattern. You know, maybe in, inadequacy or fear or inferiority or rejection. You know, those are sort of the cycles of things that the enemy takes us down. So, you know, rejection is a big one. You know, and the enemy will always push our buttons. So, you know, I have this sort of problem in church meetings because I'm really busy on a Sunday morning. I'm focused. You know, I'm usually somewhere else in the spiritual realm. I used to set up all my equipment and I get ready. Sometimes I don't see people. And often people want me to stay alive. You know, Particularly significant other people. Now I hate all that stuff. It's fine, just like everybody else. But some people are like, no, sometimes I don't see them. And the little things is wrong. How do you not like to hear? You know, he, he doesn't like you. Look, he can't even say hello to you. You know, yeah, he's going to reject you like everybody else. But you're so rejected, aren't you? And you get this little thing in your head. It's a familiar spirit. The uh, best thing to do is the first time you hear it, you take it captive and tell it to get lost. But because you've gone around that cycle so long and you actually feel rejected because you live under rejection, you agree with it. Yeah, you know, no one really likes me here. I don't want to feel part of this. You know, you, you have that cycle of rejection and isolation and exclusion simply because someone didn't say hello. But that's how things simply things can be triggered. When we have that insecurity that we carry. And there may be many other cycles of behavior that you go through, but you want to break patterns of sin that you need to break. So agree, just repent and renounce it. It may be generational iniquity. So if it is, repent and stand in identification with your family. Forgive them who introduced this into your family. It could be many generations back, because every generation third and fourth generation and do it, we start the cycle for the next third and fourth generation. So this pattern can go on for a long time. So forgive, release them, repent and renounce the sin on their behalf. So you agree with the accusation against your generation one. Receive God's judgment, you're not guilty. That's the amazing thing here. You are not guilty. You're over of righteousness. God does not hold it against you. But what we're dealing with here is what the judicial right of the enemy is, because he has a legalist. So God doesn't hold it against you, the enemy does. So what you're doing is actually you're receiving the verdict from the judge that says you're not guilty, therefore you have authority against the enemy, because now that judgment is released on him, so he has no legal rights anymore. And if he tries to come against you, you have the right to say, get lost. You have no right because I have this paper that separates me from this behavior, this mindset. I'm divorced from this, but no longer have authority over me. 
so that I release that judgment upon all who stand there, all the accusers, so everybody knows in that realm that there is no legal right. All legal rights are the only way removed from this situation. Now, you have the legal right, you can enforce it. But you must enforce it. So take the verdict and put it in your heart. Now, this is my verdict. This is my authorization. Then be open. Sometimes you need to do something. Sometimes you need to declare or decree or whatever your spirit needs you to do. But all time be motivated by love. You know, in everything, it must be to do love. Now, I don't have any love for the enemy, but I do need to have love for those who've gone before me and for other things. And I'll explain a little bit more. You may need to do something in, this, in the practical, in the natural realm. If God may well give you something to do to deal with something. The minor spirits are the whisperers. They are those little whisperers. They know exactly what you're like and they want to take you down the cycles of behavior. And sometimes you're halfway through the cycles and all one way down here again. But you get to learn quickly to recognize the initial triggers for the cycles. And then you can stand and take them captive. So you go to the mobile court. Mere spirits and here they the same process, accept the weakness and be judged. Release God's judgment. Now, when you get a mandate to do separately, it's like you get a call from a restraining order against the enemy. If you take out a restraining order against somebody and they break the restraining order and they come closer than 100 yards or whatever it is close to you, if you accept them being there and do nothing about it, well then you've allowed them to do what they're going to do. But what would you do if someone broke a restraining order? You'd call the police. Because it's a court order. And what would happen is they would be carted back to the police, to the judge, and they can tax the court. And in a contempt of court hearing, anyone can be incarcerated without any limit for how long until they come out from the contempt. So they don't like being taken back to court. You know, when Jesus cast the demons out of Legion, they said, please don't send us there. Where? To a place where they will be incarcerated rather than free to roam around and find someone else to play. So they don't want to be incarcerated. So if you take them back to court and they break the order, like some people are like, trying to deal with the mindset. Yeah, I've dealt with it. I've got this cool for them. And then tomorrow, you get this thought in mind. Oh, it didn't work, did it? But as soon as you agree, we'll be back. We'll be back. We've already invited it back. So immediately the thought comes. Someone, someone once said, you can't stop birds flying around your hair, but you can't stop them nesting in your hair. <laughs> so you don't have to allow them to land. Take captive the thought, line it up with your verdict, and use your authority to say, get lost, I'm not believing this. I'm not listening to this. We have no right to bring this. And because they've broken the court order, they take them back to court immediately and say before the judge they've broken the order. Release a greater sentence. You only have to do that a few times. They stop. You know, they always stop because they do not want a greater sentence. What do you do when accusations are made against people? And this is really important. Because you will receive accusations, people will accuse you of all sorts of things which you may not have done. My first reaction to this is not to be defensive. Right. There may be no smoke without fire. So be prepared to help yourself. Go to God and say, God, is there anything in what they're accusing you of? Now, your first reaction should be say no. There isn't. But actually, see honestly and ask God. And if there is something, go and help yourself and say, well, I'm really sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. I've gone to God. He showed me that. He's going to deal with it in me. So thank you very much. I just ask for your forgiveness. Now, who's going to do that? There's no reason why you shouldn't. Because why not? Well, in pride. Well, stop us. That will work right there. But let's say there is no truth in the accusation. Forgive them and release them. And bless them. You don't need your pound of flesh. You don't need to go back. I've been to God, and God said there's nothing, so you're wrong. (laughs) 
forgiven and released them. And so you're still back to them and to the behavior. So it's important to forgive and release them and to bless them. And it's Jesus said, what do you do in blessing those who persecute you is to pop coals on the head. Now, don't choose to do this because you want them to be punished. Because coals on the head is a punishment. It's actually the fire of God that can come and purify and refine them. Yeah. So it allows them to be changed. If they're coming with a bad attitude or a problem, why they've done this in the first place? You must love them and want the best for them. So it's a test when people say nasty things and make accusations which aren't true. But it really tests us. Yeah. It tests our attitude. It tests whether we're willing to love, whether we're willing to do the right thing, or whether we're going to get angry or bitter or resentful. And then have something against them, and then the enemy's got something in you again. So make sure you deal with it correctly. Because it's really, really important. And I've got lots of testimonies of how we've done this and how this has worked. Um, one of the corporate testaments we did recently, we had a lady who um, part of the church, she's a sort of an older lady, um, and she um, she went into hospital for an operation, a small operation, and she ended up getting necrotosis fasciitis. Which is a bug that basically eats you, eats your flesh. So she was in ICU and they said she was going to die, like soon. So we were like, okay, well, this is not the word well for her life. So we're going to call a court case. So we called our bench together. We stepped into heaven, we stepped her in the accusations, stood on our behalf because she's in our circle of influence, our authority, she's part of the church. So we can release the blessing to her. So we took it down and we stood there and heard the accusations, like lots of them. And those accusations were negativity and things like that, which she had been responsible for speaking and doing. So we repented on her behalf. We asked forgiveness on her behalf. We received the judgment. We released the judgment and we got a verdict that she could be brought into health. But the enemy's legal access because of what she was doing was removed. And she was in ICU, she was no, no place that she could do this for herself. So immediately then, we received that verdict. Okay, now we need a strategy. What are we supposed to do with this verdict? So A, we declared it, and then we gave it to our healing managing people, who are the authority of healing. And we said, look, this is the verdict that we've got. Go and exercise that verdict. Go and see her in, in the hospital. We'll go and make sure you can get near, near her and release that verdict. Which is what we did. And I was practicing it. Translating around in the spirit at the time, so I thought, well, I'm going to take that verdict and go into a hospital room and prepare it. So I rebuked the spirit of death, which was there, because now I've got life verdict. And um, they went in the next day and they prayed for her, and within a week she was out. You know, and if we had not done that, the enemy would have had access. Now, this is the key we had stepped in on her behalf. If she was going to remain in health, she needs to deal with all the accusations yeah. that were against her herself. Because we weren't, we just dealt with it from a position of authority. She needed to change. So then someone's responsible to her and say, Look, we've done this court case for you, but this was some of the accusations against you. We really want to help you recognize that some of the things you've been saying and some of the things you've been doing to yourself have given legal right to the access to you. So then, can we minister to you? Can we pray for you? Can we help you? to be free from these things. So you have to then, when you're doing it all about some of them, you then have to give them the opportunity to respond. Uh, we had a really fun instance of, of doing a court case recently. Uh, a lady in the church um, sent a parcel at Christmas and it didn't arrive. And so she got to the end of January and she was like, you know, this parcel hasn't arrived. So she thought, well, it must be some blockage system. And she's went into court and there was some sort of blockage exactly what it was. Um, so she released the judgment and demanded the parcel be delivered and the next day it was delivered. And then her father-in-law heard that testimony and was reminded of the fact that he sent the parcel six months ago and it never arrived. So he went to the court, took that testimony, heard it, next day it arrived. <laughs> so these things can be very powerful to with blockages. Yeah. Another guy in the church, he um, was in business, he 
uh, have an invoice, you get a job, he was a builder, he did some job for someone, then paid him. And for three months, he was sending the reminders to pay the job, it was a large job, he wouldn't need money, then paid him. So he thought, okay, there's got to be a reason for here. So he went into the court, actually found there was an accusation in his family line that one of his family line of business had been somewhat unrighteous and unscrupulous. So he had repented on their behalf. Next day, he got a, a message, text message from these people saying, oh, we've lost your invoice, we would really like to pay, so could you just send it again? And then he got paid for it. Same guy was working on a business deal, trying to get something done in China to produce some prototypes or something he was trying to invent. And he was having no trouble, all sorts of trouble trying to connect, he wouldn't answer his phone and messages, all sorts of problems, just couldn't get it. So he, he was again doing this, found out it was again some sort of business deal thing he needs to deal with. While he's there praying, his mobile phone goes off with a text saying from China saying, Okay, we really need to speak to you urgently because we really need to sort these situations out. Yeah. Some of this stuff works quickly. Sometimes you have to push through. But there's lots of instances. We've done this in so many times within our projects. <laughs> When there have been issues that we've needed breakthroughs in, gone to hear what the accusations are, deal with the accusations, so we have breakthroughs. You know, people have got jobs doing this. You know, we had one instance where um, it's, uh, one of our leaders, their son, who's a teenager in school, came home and for a few days was somewhat low, bad behaved, and sort of something going on. So they pushed him, what's going on? Didn't want to tell them. So they pushed him a little bit more and eventually he was being bullied. But he was being bullied by girls. But that's not a good thing when you're a 13 year old boy. So they said to him, Well, is there anything you've done that might provoke this bullying? So he was sort of, Well, well, I might have just said something. <laughs> so they said, Right, well, are you willing to repent what you said? Yeah. Okay, well, let's go and deal with this condition. So he repented of what he said. Um, they got a call order a verdict to separate it from it in the situation, went through the process, dealt with the accusation, gave this authority. And so look, you need to exercise this authority now. Do you believe that this is going to stop? So he said yes. So he goes into the school the next day. The girls, three girls are standing there, and he's like looking, thinking, oh my. And uh, we walk past them and they, they open their mouths and nothing came out. They never had another problem. So there are many things that we can do judicially, you know, to separate yourself from behaviors, to deal with blockages, to deal with accusations, because the enemy always wants to roll, kill, and destroy. But God always wants to give abundant life. So we have to learn how to access and do these things. So here's a personal example of what to do. You know, you've probably got these. I know Peter's got a big list of how to do court cases. You can do them for healing. One of the uh, one of the interesting ones, you can take your own body to court and ask it what the accusations are against you. If you dare. But if you do, you have to be willing to change your lifestyle to deal with the accusations. Because we don't want our body to be open to sickness or anything else. So if you're going to step in, let's say on behalf of your own situation, it's like, Father, I step into the place of responsibility in the court of heaven. I accept responsibility, firstly as a priest of my own life, and take the covering of your word, the word of God, the word of Jesus, and place it on my hand as a covering of your love. Father, I've sinned. Confess what it is. You know, if it's a secret hidden thing that no one else knows, confess it. I accept responsibility for this area to give an access and express in sin. Call it as it is. Don't try and you know, call it my little weakness or my little problem, sin, sin, only. Stand, and today I stand and take responsibility, I repent and renounce this behavior and mindset. I call all my accusers to come before this court. I demand to hear the accusation and all the legal rights associated with it. Every demonic spirit associated with this area of my life accuses me, I agree with you. So again, don't argue, just agree quickly. Now, agree with your adversary for me. So then I ask you, Father, to judge me according to the covenant of your love and love you smile. Stand under the judgment. But you know what's coming. Nothing to be fearful of. 
No? Judge this in me to destroy the yoke of power of this sin. So that judgment that says you're free can be judged and brought into your life to separate you from it. And as for divorce came from its influence, I confess that I'm divorced from this influence in life. You have to agree with the verdict. There's no point having a verdict if you don't agree with it. Because that's what your legal right is to enforce it. I ask you to judge it in me according to the papers. Separate it from me and judge it so I do not operate by default in my mind, in my brain. Because we have habitual patterns that are neural pathways that are triggered and we automatically go down the memory route. So we need those neural pathways broken open so that we don't go down that automatically. Because some of those things are there because of desires that are burst out of brokenness. We've got into certain things because we're broken and we have needs that we seek to meet in the wrong place. Now, pornography is a huge one in men because they have needs that they got caught and hooked into a situation that brought them temporary trading things on behalf of that. And then actually they put into it and then they get a whole cycle of shame and guilt and condemnation. It goes round and round again until you break it. So we need to break the desires. Why are they there? What is broken in me that sort me to do that rather than a normal relationship with a normal person? Because you know, relationship with images have no emotional attachment. So sometimes we're broken and we need healing, and this will identify what those things are. So that, let that be judged in me so that those patterns of brokenness and memory are broken in my life. I judge my life according to the test of your covering. I release this covering over all who stand here and release judgment over every area associated with this lie. So everyone knows now, all the enemy knows that you have a judgment. For you. Release judgment according to the testimony in my life because I'm now free. But confess the truth. I'm free. I take the papers in my heart and imagine of my life and I step back into the circle of Now administrate it. Now make sure that a restraining order or a court paper isn't broken. Now take captive every thought and bring it into alignment with this judgment and say, You have no right. I'm not going down that route. Because what you're then doing is creating a new pathway of how you deal with this situation, which is not the cycle that we want to go down. Because now you hear this, something comes and you take, oh, now this is the cycle. I am now accepting this because I am under the authority of the word, I have this all verdict, and so I say no. I have authority to say no, and you say that a few times and you take a new cycle. It's no longer has any effect, it's not a habit. You've broken it because you have the power against it and over it. So I am just divorced from heaven, and I'm in Jesus' name. So I have the power of his attorney to continually affect that judgment in my life. So it's really important to know your identity as kings and priests. Know your authority as sons. Know your calling and spirit that you have. And just keep practicing. Step into this, deal with it. Now, once I took a familiar spirit into the court about 10 times in a day, Never ever claim me again. Now, Ian Clayton teaches that you can take all the ones that you know of in with them, and actually then they all start falling out. Because none of them will be judged, and they'll give each other up. Because there's no honor amongst demons. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you do deliverance, you find that some of the minions get pushed out first. Because they're sacrificed. Because you know? there are higher levels of demons, and they don't want you see it, so they'll push the other ones out. And if you don't have discernment, you may think it's all over, but well, it isn't. Mm. So you need to serve in this. Uh, so just continue to do the process. You know, I mean, we could go into this now, so I'm not going to go into exercise because I know they want to get ready for lunch and dinner and stuff like that. So, you know, just practice this yourself. You just have to step in, call the accusations, and deal with it. You know, and practice. Practice it corporately when you're together. Because there are some things you want to maybe do this over in your city or over your ecclesia or over your area. It's not just individual things, you can do this. You know, what are the accusations of the enemy that's causing the blockage in our community? What's causing this cultural issue? What's causing this situation where we have this sin in our area? That's the authority you have when you have the governmental influence that you can bring to deal with these things. So you have authority to judge the court, so use it. 
They're seriously using it. They use this in the process of the living sacrifice. They use this in the process of the gates. So when you see a familiar spirit in the gateway, you use this to get rid of it. That's a really, really key thing to do because we have to learn to bring judicial authority in our lives rather than just, oh God, we help. Now God will help us, but he will rather we do it ourselves in authority because we have authority. As we mature, we can exercise that and follow the process here. Okay, is that all right? That was a record. <laughs> if you've ever uh, been on a hangout with Mike, you get uh, maybe two questions. <laughs> uh, but it's it's awesome. It's great. Um, we do need a couple of volunteers and a couple of guys to help set up tables. They're going to put tables like in the hallway so we can work with food in the hallway. We'll leave a little more room out there. But um, one thing I wanted to just, as a prophetic act, uh, you know, I've been ringing this bell here. As a prophetic act, I'd like to invite everybody, as you feel that, you don't have to, but if you want to, during the break here and up until the meeting tonight, if you will come by here, if the Lord leads you, and ring this bell as a for a couple of things. One, to show that you're hearing and receiving the sound. Secondly, to agree with and vibrate with the resonance of this sound. I mean, in your own life, in your own spirit, and everything like that. And then with intent that you're showing that you're a son and a priest in the order of Melchizedek, that you're taking the sound out. That's the pro That's the whole thing about this government stuff. It, you know, we learn all this stuff. I mean, we've been, my wife and I, probably most of you, you've been through all the different stuff, the prophetic movement, the, you know, the visionary movement, the inner healing, all that stuff, and it was all good information. It's awesome. It's, it's cool. And we used it for ourselves. But not much, unfortunately, have taken it out. I mean, like, administrate it to the earth. Administrate it as governmentally, like he was, like Mike was just talking about, it, to the earth. God is wanting sons on the earth. That's why this government stuff is so important. So I just wanted to encourage everybody to come up here and do that, do that at some point as the Lord leads. Again, no obligation, nothing like that. Um, but do it, you know, let your spirit allow you to do it. So, All right, we're going to break for uh, dinner, and we'll be back here at 7. Uh, the girls are going to come and worship. They're going to come in here a little earlier tonight just to start setting the atmosphere. And uh, let's have a good time of fellowship together. <clears throat> oh, yeah, let me, um, real quick, let me, let me pray for everybody for, uh, for, for food. Bless the food. Bless the food. Bless the food. Or I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. He's going to talk. <laughs> yes, Father, we thank you. We thank you. Oh, we've been having just such a feast table. And the Lord, you're preparing a feast in the presence of our enemies. We're just able to banquet here with you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for every person that's here as we fellowship and break bread together, that we can even be doing it. Taking, taking it symbolically as your bread and as your body and your blood. And when we're drinking and we're eating, that we're even doing it, breaking bread, having the Lord's Supper by just even eating symbolically. We thank you for that, Lord. We ask you to bless it, bless everyone that uh, brought stuff, and even those that didn't. No, no. We just ask everybody to, to be blessed, Lord, and this would nourish their bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, and all the DNA would be changed so that it's pure <laughs> and perfect for our bodies. Amen. Peter. 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 Oh, he'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs>